I think I have eight o'clock here. So why don't we uh, get started with tonight's uh, journal club. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to tune in for this version of, uh, of the Next Generation Editors Journal Club uh, through ASJ. I hope everybody's doing well, keeping healthy. Um, my name's Ryan Austin. I'm a plastic surgeon here in Toronto, Ontario, and I've been serving as the lead of this NGE section. This is our second, uh, our second journal club. And I'd also like to introduce Miriam Saheb Alzamani, who's a colleague of mine and a fellow NGE from Mississauga, Ontario, just down the road. She's going to be moderating the chat box tonight. Uh, and so make sure that you keep your chat feed open, follow along, answer the polls, feel free to ask questions, make comments during the presentations, and we'll try and get to as many of those comments uh, as we can throughout the course of the evening. So for those of you who are regular uh, ASJ Journal Club attendees, you'll know that two months ago, we set a record actually for attendance at the ASJ Journal Clubs. Uh, and then that record was immediately broken last month with, uh, with last month's Young Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons Journal Club. So I'm happy to report that everybody's tuning in. Everybody seems to be enjoying this forum. Um, and I'm hoping that we can keep that trend up tonight. We had fantastic registration numbers for tonight's uh, journal club titled Optimizing Breast Pocket Irrigation, the BIA ALCL Era, in the June 2020 issue of ASJ. And we're lucky to have two great discussants here tonight who need no introduction, but I'm contractually obligated to give one anyway. So first up, we have the senior author of this month's article, Dr. William P. Adams, Jr. Uh, Dr. Adams is a graduate from Vanderbilt School of Medicine before completing his residency in plastic surgery at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, where uh, Dr. Adams now maintains his private practice and also serves as, the, as an Associate professor, professor of Aesthetic Surgery at UT Southwestern. Dr. Adams is not only the Program Director of the UT Southwestern Aesthetic Fellowship, but he also recently became President-elect of the Aesthetic Society. Dr. Adams is an international authority on aesthetic breast surgery, and he has worked throughout his career to advance the science behind breast implant irrigation solutions. So we're lucky to have Dr. Adams uh, out with us tonight. We're also fortunate to have Dr. Julie Kana here with us tonight to provide her in, uh, insight and expertise and also hopefully make Dr. Adams sweat a little bit. Dr. Kana is a graduate of the University of Ottawa Medical School and she completed her residency in plastic surgery at University in Hamilton, Ontario. Dr. Canada, uh, Dr. Kana is a past president of the Canadian Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery and she currently serves as the Canadian member on the Judicial Council with the Aesthetic Society as well. Dr. Khan has published an ASJ on her experience with aesthetic surgery and aesthetic medicine. So thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for being here tonight as well. With that being said, I'll hand the screen off to Dr. Adams for his presentation. Uh, so please take it away and uh, everyone enjoy. Great. Well, thanks so much, Ryan and, and Miriam and, and Phaedra uh, for putting this together. We really appreciate ASJ asking us to present this at Journal Club, and I've done one of these again um, about six months ago, and just fantastic. So it's a great forum. I hope everybody enjoys it. Uh, the paper here, you can see uh, the paper just published in print. It was published uh, last fall online. Um, just as a means of disclosure, uh, really, I don't have anything to disclose other than this was an ASURF study. Um, and I've, I've been researching and developing expertise in this area for about 20 plus years and have a, a real passion for it. So um, we feel very fortunate to have been able to publish this in ASJ, being the great journal it is. I just wanted to say a couple things about my co-author. So Dr. Eric Culbertson was my fellow in 2016 and 17. And he did the lion's share of the work and the study. Actually, believe it or not, as a plastic surgeon, Eric spent a lot of time in the microbiology lab, uh, plating things and doing a lot of the methodology. methodology. And he was uh, integral, actually, in, in the data that, that you see in the paper. Um, Anand Diva has been a longtime uh, collaborator and re research partner of mine. I met him 20 plus years ago. Also, a keen interest in, in bacteria and biofilms. And David Greenberg is my collaborator at UT Southwestern, and he is an inf uh, infectious disease doctor um, and microbiologist. Um, great guy, world renowned, uh, especially with regard to biofilms. And, and it's been um, fantastic having him as a collaborator for some of these uh, studies. So, 
Um, let's, you know, what I'm going to do is just briefly go through a little bit of the history in, in this paper. And then um, I think that Julie, I've known Julie for a long time. She's a fantastic class surgeon, great educator. I think that she'll be able to discuss things. And then I know Ryan and uh, Miriam will lead a great discussion. So I hope you enjoy it. So, you know, I got into this 20 years ago when I was a resident. It was 1996. You know, people knew about the subclinical infection of capsular contracture, but most people kind of felt it was staph epi was, was causing the problem. And what we've learned is that it's really a polymicrobial problem. It's really not just one bacteria, but all these different bacteria you see listed were implicated in the formation of capsular contracture. Um, and therefore, if we're doing things in the operating room, we want to be able to cover or, or minimize the bacterial load of all these different bacteria. So when in 1996, I was working with these uh, respective faculty of mine, and it was just kind of a peculiar situation because all of them were using various different antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations, um, including, um, hey guys, can you hold it down? Sorry. Um, all of them were using different uh, breast pocket irrigations, um, but really had no rhyme or reason why they were doing so. So things like tea-colored betadine. Uh, I was from the South, I knew a lot about tea, like that didn't make any sense to me. Double antibiotic solution, that was another, that was the one, the one I actually liked the best. And the funny thing was, is the nurse, basically was that whatever two antibiotics a nurse could get her hands on that day was double antibiotic solution. So, I kept asking questions and finally Fritz Barton, I think out of frustration said, hey man, you just need to go to the lab and you should study that. So we did. So we took that this to the laboratory and we did a lot of different studies this starting 20 years ago. And this was the first of the ones where we described um, beta nine triple, um, but it was really this combination of um, either irrigations or components that would cover all these different types of bacteria that we were worried about. So not only staph epi, and by the way, we found that all those single agents that you saw other than straight betadine that my faculty were, didn't work most, even against staph epi, let alone these other bacteria that we were worried about. Um, and so through our studies early in, in um, 2000 and uh, 2001, we described three recommended antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations. You can see them here. We had beta non triple um, and then non beta non triple antibiotic and then 50% beta non. And those were the three solutions that were recommended. They had the most polymicrobial activity. Uh, and uh, subsequently, in our clinical study, we, we demonstrated uh, 10 times lower capture contracture rate using uh, those antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations, but we weren't the only ones that were looking at this. And actually, this findings were very similar. So you can see below uh, Tom Weiner, who I think is on this call, published some fantastic studies uh, using 50% uh, beta 9. He also showed uh, a 10 times lower capture contracture rate. A finished study by Giordano also showed a 10 times lower capture contracture rate using these solutions and a study out of Michigan had similar 10 times lower reduction. So um, many different researchers have found, uh, come to the same conclusion. So getting into this study, 20 years later, many surgeons have used these different uh, antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations, but in the, the era of breast implant ALCL, the question was, do these irrigations work against what most experts believe is a bacterial trigger for this disease. It's really hard to refute that when you look at the, the wealth of the data, the distribution of cases, the case clusters, and it does seem to be a shift in, in the gram negative microbiome that is, is causing that transformative post response with breast implant ALCL. So the question was, do these irrigations work against these gram negative bacteria? And then there were some uh, the other uh, potential new irrigations, chlorhexidine, Ericept, uh, hypochlorous acid, silver gel that we also tested. And we used a standardized technique and we uh, varied concentration and contact time, which is basically the standard of how you would uh, test these type of things. Um, this is a table from the paper, um, but, but again, just um, in a high level, you know, we, we looked at bactericidal activity 
So bactericidal was anything greater than three logs reduction, which is kind of the standard 99.9% .9 reduction of bacteria. So anything greater than that was considered bactericidal and anything less than that was non-bactericidal. So you can look at this, this chart, it's fairly busy, but basically the blue is bad um, and the darker colors are, are good. Uh, um, I've kind of summarized that, that data here along with um, some other things. We you know, looked at what with these different antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations are approved around breast implants, um, standard dilutional testing, such as we did in the study, uh, protein, protein soil testings, wound healing effects, long-term effects of, of breast implants, um, being off the shelf, something that you don't have to prepare and cost. But you can see the, the green, the more green, the better, um, uh, and the more the red, the worse. So in our study, we really found the betadine containing irrigations to be superior, particularly uh, with the gram negative bacteria. The last thing in this paper that we talk about is, is really some of the urban legends. And there's been many over the past 20 years, certainly that I've I've heard and have been brought to me, uh, and we address them at the end of the paper. Um, so I just thought it's useful, I think, because a lot of people have questions about this, but in terms of betadine dilution, when we say 50% betadine, um, just so there's no confusion, 50% betadine is basically if you take the stock solution and mix it half and half with saline, that would be 50% betadine. Um, remember, betadine or povidine iodine is then 10% povidon iodine and 1% available iodine. Um, the other uh, thing that comes up sometimes people say, well, betadine is, is non-sterile. Um, that's, um, I would say the outside of the bottle is non-sterile, but betadine, povidon iodine is an exceptional antiseptic. Actually, there's no known resistance to betadine. Uh, we've never cultured anything out of betadine solution or povidon iodine solutions. Um, you can actually get sterile preps of betadine. This is just down the bottom here. This is from Medline. It's a, it's a skin prep kit. It, you've all seen them. It has little sponge sticks. It has two bottles of sterile betadine, all prepackaged in a sterile um, container. Uh, the reality is what we use is single-use bottles. So the outside of the bottle is not sterile, but it's just prepared by the nurses and, and mixed in the operating room. Uh, quadruple, that's where people were getting confused about betadine triple and thinking that had different antibiotics. And so they were really using non-betadine triple antibiotic, which contained bacitracin, genomycin, and, and um, uh, cefazolin, and then adding betadine to that, to that. But we've tested that. It doesn't really add anything to uh, the original solutions. And then there's kind of the new girl in town effect or these different things that come up, but are irrigations that don't have a lot of data behind them. And sometimes people find those appealing. Um, uh, but again, uh, those, none of those really tested well in, in our studies and uh, also others done by, by other people. Um, and then lastly, just remember, it's about, we're, we're not going to completely sterilize a, a breast implant pocket. It's about bacterial load, relative bacterial load or net bacterial load and threshold. And those are, are what give you the end result. So in conclusion, um, you know, there's really no magic bullet. You know, it's not one thing you can do. Uh, it's, it's kind of the net effect of, of all these different things, but the details do matter. And so I would leave you with really follow the science. The science is always the, the best way to, to deal with these things. So follow the science. There's, there's actually been 31 studies now that support number one, these antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations. But in this study, we found the betadine containing irrigations to be superior. And do remember there's consequences um, when you don't do that. And I can just tell you anecdotally, I have friends, um, people I know that um, have been part of some of these case clusters. Uh, for example, someone that uses bacitracin irrigation only that we showed 20 years ago, it doesn't work even against the most common bacterias. And, and they have three cases of ALCL. And I know some others have used just cefazolin irrigation um, and they have multiple cases of, of ALCL. So, you know, when, when you don't follow the science, um, then, you know, there is uh, consequences associated with that. Um, and, and again, these antimicrobial best pocket irrigations are really just one part of the whole 14 point plan. Um, that's not anything new, but, you know, we've been educating on that for many, many years. Um, 
beware of the urban legends and then remember it's just really the net bacterial load that we're worried about so we can use these betadine containing irrigations to try to help minimize that load but there's many other things that we do as well that impact uh, the outcome of the patient and with that i'm going to turn it back to uh, ryan and and julie and thanks thanks for having me present that's great thank you so much dr adams that's a fantastic review of an excellent paper and so uh, I'd love to hear uh, Dr. Khanna's thoughts and uh, any rebuttals, questions, concerns, or issues. You know, one of the things that uh, when I read this paper, as always, Bill, you do a great, great job and you're very scientific and very clear, but it really, this was something that was really bothering me about ALCL for a while when I first heard about it, you know, in 2015. And if we look, and many people on this call are too young to remember this, but we had betadine taken off the market or we were banned from using it because of integrity of the implant. And I really felt that that had something to do with the subsequent uprise in seeing cases of ALCL with textured implants. Because if you look at when textured implants were introduced, especially in North America, you know, we were two, 1999, I put my first 410 in, and we lost the use of betadine around 2001. And I think that lingered for a while, even though we know what year did it change, Bill, that I think it was around 2000, um, 2017. 12, 17. But yeah. I think people held on even longer for not using it, and they didn't switch so easy. And I really wonder if it was just a double-edged sword that we got into this situation because we were told not to use a product um, because of that. And, and I really, that was something I firmly believed in. And I also was quietly off-label using it in 2000, in 2000 even at, or 2001, I started using it right away when I went to my own clinic. They wouldn't let me do it in the hospital, but in my own clinic, I said, you guys are wrong. And I kept going because it didn't make sense because most of the integrity data was all about injecting an implant. So I don't know, I think we really saw this uprise in ALCL, I think that might have been a big component of it. And your data is, is also going in that direction as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's certainly feasible. I, I do think that there are many surgeons, at least in, in our kind of survey of surgeons over the years, many surgeons were using beta-9 off-label. Um, Certainly, if they were using, say, the non-antibiotic triple uh, or non-beta non-triple antibiotic, um, that also had excellent activity uh, against these gram-negative bacteria, albeit it took longer contact time. So you didn't want to dilute your solution out with some some technique things that you can do. I think the other thing that plays a big role in just why we we saw these cases is because bacteria have evolved over time. You know, we know this from many other areas of medicine. Uh, bacteria 20 years ago weren't causing issues and 20 years later the same bacteria are causing issues in ICUs and, and all sorts of device associated infections so bacteria have evolved too and and I think sometimes you know the the knee-jerk response is certain things if I have a case of ALCL it means I'm a bad surgeon not at all there's a lot of factors there's patient factors there's genetic factors uh, there's bacterial differences across the world and bacteria have evolved. So, you know, you just do the best you can do, um, but it doesn't mean that uh, you're a bad surgeon, but I think it also behooves us as, as surgeons trying to do the best thing for our patients to critically look and look at our technique and try to always optimize that. It's interesting you say that because one of your criticisms in the discussion was using bacterial cultures that they considered old. They said old standards. Like, what do you? That was one of the discussions points. Well, I th we we like say I, we've collaborated with with David Greenberg at, in uh, who's a world renowned microbiologist and infectious disease doctor, um, and we selected the bacterial strains that we thought best represented what we currently deal with. Um, you know, there there are certain standards that 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 we do, and and frankly, across I mean across cities bacterial strains are different. So it's just, it's not, it's not really a valid criticism to say, we'll use the wrong bacterial strains because even across half a city, there's many different 
um, strains of bacteria and there are different virulences and certainly across states or countries or continents, um, they're, they're huge. So it's just, you know, you have to pick what you think is best and, and go with that. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, especially because we have some of the younger surgeons on here, is let's talk about how you use irrigation because I wouldn't want newer surgeons, younger surgeons mixing their triple antibiotic with their betadine, washing the pocket out and looking for bleeders. So give some advice to the younger generation. What's the best way to use this in the course of a case? Because I don't think we talk about that. You know, we, well, we talk you know, about it, but it's important, you know, where, how you use it, when you use it, is it the only irrigation you use, and what can we educate them on that? Yeah, I mean, the key, the key, and this is, is uh, you'll see this in the paper, we, we discuss this in terms of your protocol or process for, you know, just like there's a process of breast augmentation, there's a process for, for breast pocket preparation. Um, so you want to dissect your pocket, you know, check everything, make sure that it's, it's hemostatic, there's, there's nothing more to do. And then you wanna go through your process of preparing that pocket. So, you know, there's basically certain steps that, that we do the exact same way every time, but when it comes to, and the things such as, you know, we, we put tegaderms over the nipples, we, I, I use a uh, chlorhexidine prep stick to reprep the skin that, around where the, the, the implant's gonna go. We, we rewash any instrument that's going, gonna go into the pocket. Um, what's key with the antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations is that the two things, remember, is concentration and contact time that, that produces efficacy. So you don't wanna dilute your antimicrobial breast pocket irrigation. That was one of the things that we found, the beta-9 containing irrigations compared to everything else had far better resistance to any kind of dilution. But when you use these things, there's ways to do it. So you don't just put in some of your antimicrobial breast pocket irrigation and then a bunch of saline and all of a sudden you've just, exactly. maybe, maybe you may have diluted it down to one-tenth of what the original concentration was. Um, so you wanna be careful about that. So what, the way we, we do that is we use two um, sequential 75 cc's of saline and evacuate that completely out. And then we do another 75 cc's of our, I use betadine triple or 50% betadine. Um, and we instill that and evacuate that completely out. And then we do one final 75 cc's of uh, betadine triple or 50% betadine and leave that in the pocket. So we don't irrigate it out. And then we place the implant some of the solution will come out and then we close. And so I know from personal observation that I've seen um, that, that solution in the pocket for at least 18 hours. And this study, by 15 minutes, the first time point, every, it, it, it kills everything. So, yeah. but if you dilute it um, or you wash it out, you know, it depends on, um, you know, it, it may, not, uh, may not work as well. The other thing to remember is that we were, this, this we actually have a second part of the study that we uh, will be submitting to ASJ, and we hope uh, the editors will hope 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 to have them um, accept this chart. That looks at biofilm. This study looks at planktonic bacteria, so the free floating bacteria. Certainly, in primary breast surgery, that the uh, biofilms don't film form quick enough to be an issue during your surgery. Um, it takes uh, probably six hours, um, even for the fastest forming biofilms, are probably more like 24 for most of them uh, to, to form. So this is for planktonic bacteria. So the other thing, you know, we talk a lot about betadine being, you know, cidal, you know, bactericidal, but worrying about wound healing. And I've heard this forever and I haven't seen it. Have you had wound healing problems? I mean, maybe we need to ask Dr. Narai, but it's, it's an issue we keep talking about. But unless you're soaking your incision constantly, which we do when there's an infection in it, but it's not an issue. You don't have to worry about that aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of data. We've used, we, we've, I've always used the beta-9 containing irrigations. Um, you know, there was Bill Lineweaver was, a, I met him when I was at Stanford and he was doing studies and he published that even very low concentrations of beta-9 in, inhibited fibroblasts in culture. Um, so that was one of the things when we, you know, there was this thing about beta-9 or iodine could affect the shell of the implant. That, I think uh, you mentioned that 
that really was intraluminal. Somebody was filling saline implants with, exactly. with, with betadine. Um, there's never been any data, including a study I did with uh, Leroy Young, looking at the shells of implants and testing those, that any extraluminal betadine has any detrimental effect on a breast implant. Um, uh, and then certainly, we tried to have the lowest concentration and the most polymicrobial effect. And that's how we came up with beta nine triple. Um, but I, you know, I see Tom Weiner on there. Tom, Tom's done, like, say, some fantastic studies with fifty percent beta nine. I don't know. If Tom wants to comment about yeah, I, I, I do. healing things. I do. <clears throat> so thanks, Bill and uh, Julie. Uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely correct um, that um, the ALCL. This has been. Uh, this I actually asked Bill this a few months ago about ALCL. Um, my concern was when the FDA banned betadine uh, with no good reason whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the reasons were leading to patient harm. And, you know, I have a series of about five papers on betadine that I, um, uh, I let everyone know my very uh, obnoxious letters to the FDA telling him, I use betadine, please come and take my license if you think I'm wrong. And of course, they wouldn't do it. Um, that was my question to Bill is, did, did the FDA cause this rise in ALCL many, many years later? And I am, I can, I'm a conspiracy theorist, Bill knows this, and I think it's true. All right. I, <laughs> I think agree. It, I think it's true. So, but that aside, um, I, I also agree with Bill. Don't wash the betadine out. If you're washing it out, you're um, just uh, 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 cowering down to uh, to the old ban on betadine from the FDA, and it, it's it's not. It shouldn't be washed out. If you're washing it out, you're you're defeating the purpose of using it. There's no harm to the implant. I've been using this uh, ever since I was in training with Tom Biggs. Uh, who taught me to use betadine. And then, of course, you know, my series of papers on betadine and, of course, the incision paper about uh, perirelar incision. Um, you asked about wound healing problems. And this, this, I think, is one of the real keys that especially, well, actually, many people overlook. <clears throat> there are two types of betadine that you need to be considering. There's betadine scrub and there's betadine paint. So betadine scrub is a detergent. And, and many people don't really think about this. So, you know, the nurse just squirts some betadine in the cup, uh, you know, for the circulator, I mean, the circulator does for the scrub tech to use, and they don't really think about it. Don't use betadine scrub. It's a detergent. It will cause wound healing problems, absolutely. All right? And it, it's solution and detergent is the other definitions of them. Correct. So, so you, what you want to use is beta, it, what, what's called beta, either betadine solution or betadine paint. That is the non-detergent version of it, and that's what you have to use because it's not the betadine that has caused the wound healing problems in the past. It's the detergent fraction, right. um, and that's important to realize. Now, if you use 100% betadine, you know, the 10%, 100% of that without dilution, yeah, I think you'd probably get some wound healing problems, but we don't do that. That's why I use a 50% uh, solution for, uh, for betadine, and it's tremendously effective. Um, you know, and, and let me jump ahead just for a second to the commentary that was posted on Bill's paper um, and saying that um, there's no good you know, long-term data showing that you know, this is effective and all that. The, the long-term data is there. I've been doing this. Uh, you know, I, my practice is what, 26 years old, and I've been doing it for that long. If I get a patient that comes in after a breast augmentation, of course, I only use inframammary incisions. I don't have a problem with perirelar incisions, but you know my paper on that. Um, if I have a patient come in with capsular contracture, I'm shocked. All right. My incidence of capsular contracture is not 1%. It's way below 1%. So when Bill says that it reduces it 10% and, and this commentary says there's no evidence it reduces it 10%, that's bullshit. Um, it, in my experience, in my hands, it reduces it, uh, it reduces it 
uh, 20, not, not I mean 10 times, it reduces it 20 times, it reduces it 30 times. So it, it's a dramatic improvement in contracture. And if it's doing so, whether it's betadine or, you know, Bill's triple antibiotic or a combination, um, and there's obviously no harm. If there's harm being done, I guess all the patients I've harmed are just not telling me about it. But you know, when, as soon as you have a problem with a patient, they will never get out of your hair, all right? So, and that is such good advice for the young surgeons because this is all about prevention. And to me, that's critical because that's, it's not only taking care of your patients, less risk to them, it's running your business. Right. We're doing all of those things. And yeah. let me tell you, you have a high capsule contracture rate that costs your practice. And you just, like, I'm with you, Tom. If I see a CapCon, I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. What is this? Like, I, I don't like it. And I'm worried now that I'm using more smooth implants since 2016, that number is going to go up because I felt that maybe my texture was helping me before, but it's been, it's been pretty well the same. I, I've never used textured implants in my career. All right. So, um, and my capsule contract rate is that low, you know, I do subpectoral, but it, it, I don't think it's the placement that has a big effect. It's the betadine, but we're not, we're not promoting this, you know, because we're making money from it. Bill and Julie, you and I are not stockholders in the Betadine Corporation. I wish Corporation. Betadine, yeah. that would have been good. That yeah. would have been a good Exactly. Idea. So that's not it. Um, but this is all about patient safety. Sorry about that. Let me uh, drop that. Um, so it, it's, this is all about patient safety and doing the right thing for our patients. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta listen to the science. You gotta listen to the data, you know, what you said, uh, or which Bill mentioned that it's all about bacterial load. We're trying to reduce the bacterial load, just like coronavirus is all about viral load. All right. It's all the same thing. You had to bring that up. Tom. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. We can't get into that. Can't like for five <laughs> minutes. Julie, I just want to, I want to, I completely agree with you and Tom. And I, I just want to make this comment too. Everything, you know, advancement in our specialty, it's, it's about prevention. Most of the time in surgery, how we advance the, the art and science of the surgery is, is about learning things and then preventing these issues. Just like uh, Julie and Tom have been saying, if you read the, the discussion of this paper, actually, they bring up the end, they say, um, they think we should kind of quit talking about preventing ALCL and just learn, you know, start treating it or, or talk about how the advancing in treatments. And I completely disagree because I think that I the, the, the yeah. essence of high level surgery is doing things to prevent that. And that's what this is all about. Right. It's like the old, you know, the old story about dead bodies coming down the river and learning how to deal with dead bodies, but never going up river to figure out why were there dead bodies coming down. And <laughs> to say that line actually really disturbed me a little bit because I don't think we should ever think like that. We should always be, it should be concomitant at the same time. You should be talking about prevention, working about treatment, but to ever say you should ignore that, I don't think that's a very good statement to be said. Well, it's not a good statement for the other reason that when, so, when, it, when and a statement like that is made, just like we've seen some of our colleagues on social media uh, promoting the on block capsulectomy for oh, you know for favorite. for you know breast implant illness and you know what total nonsense but don't don't you know propose something like that just because well uh you know it you charge more money for a for a contractor for a capsulectomy and implant exchange yeah. so some people that's where the money comes from so you know this is this is not about making money this is about patient safety yeah and I, but I think the, the proof is in the pudding. So if you look at, I mean, this whole, we all, we got in this regarding capsular contracture, not ALCL. And now it's obviously evolved that may, maybe ALCL is related to, I believe it clearly is related to, to some of these technique things as well. But, you know, capsular contracture rates 30 years ago were 30 to 50%. Yeah. And now, as Tom said, with it's not just an, these antimicrobial breast pocket irrigations but that's part of the part of the puzzle it's other things that we do too but we've reduced that I'm, my capsule contraction rates are the same as tom's i think we have a, a series of over 20 years now that hopefully that'll be another thing we'll put in asj um, but uh, 0.1 percent 
is our capture contraction rate. So I, I do think that the techniques, technique matters and prevention matters. And that's, that's what it's all about for your patients. Hey, Bill, can and I, I think say something? Hey, hey, this is Brad. Um, Hi, Brad. Hey, guys. hey, good to see you. Hey, you know, I just want to remind everybody that, you know, this is great to have this paper. I was really glad to see it get into the journal because there's so much conversation and discussion over the last couple of years. And some of you remember in PRS last year, there was an article or a whole thing about article about how antibiotic irrigation is nonsense um, by Swanson. And so Bill and I had done a, a, a letter to the editor, a response to that, let's say a response to that, um, talking about that where Bill really, who knows it well, out, laid out all the, the details and all of the studies and all of the you know, um, information um, to really confirm just antibiotic irrigation in general. We're talking about which one's the best, but you know, just the idea, there's still this idea, people on the podium who are saying that maybe you don't need to do antibiotic irrigation. And I think for all of us just to have this go, no, um, actually, we actually do need to do all parts of the 14 point plan or, you know, that kind of bacterial mitigation um, and papers like this to help us understand which ones to do extremely, extremely important because we've been saying for a couple of years, betadine, 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 you know, betadine, betadine, but you know, people still miss it. When I talk about it, it's like the first time, you know, the audience often has heard it. So thank you for the article. It's really, really great. I was glad to see it. Um, I did notice that you had sort of the idea at the end of the article, I remember reading it, which was that, well, if you're not allergic to antibiotics, then probably use the triple betadine. If you are, use the 50% betadine. The issue of fibroblast and healing kind of came up a little bit, but I used 50% beta-9 and I thought, well, too bad. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use my 50% beta-9. Yeah, I think like we talked about 20 years ago, there was these questions about healing and things. And so that was one of the reasons to look at things. How can we decrease the concentration of beta-9? But I think that as you've heard, there's a lot of people that have had experience using say 50% beta-9 and I would agree. And, and you know, if it depends, I think using a beta-9 containing irrigation is what I would recommend. You know, it, there's less steps, you know, it's like baking a cake. So you got to follow all, put all the right ingredients else the cake is going to taste bad. So you've got to make sure whoever's mixing that, your operating room nurse, you know, that they know, like, if they're going to do 50% of betadine, it's half and half saline and, and betadine. They can't just like put a little betadine and just whatever looks good. You know, it's, it's like a, a chemistry experiment. If they're going to do uh, betadine triple, it's it's probably even a, a little a little bit more labor intensive so you just have to make sure that if you want the simplest preparation i think 50 50 50 percent betadine is a great uh, irrigation and actually 20 years ago you know that was the same conclusion that we uh, came to in our original paper so one of the things that i thought was interesting too maybe you can comment on this dr adams is the concept in the paper that you had this Ralstonia regrowth. So you, you knocked it down a little bit with some of the salute with the hypochlorous acid, the irisep, the silver gel, but then actually as you, as you followed it out to 18 hours, it grew back. What do you think was going on with that? Well, I think part of the, again, that's why the science is so important. Um, a lot, a lot of these uh, different antiseptics like uh, hypochlorous acid, um, irisep, they're, they're basically, number one, they're not even approved for things like breast pocket irrig irrigation. They're called mechanical wound irrigation. So they're actually just like saline, they're approved for mechanical wound irrigation. Um, the, the agent, whether it's hypochlorous acid or it's uh, chlorhexidine, very dilute chlorhexidine is in it, in that solution in a very dilute form, basically to try to prevent bacteria in the bottle, like when it's on the shelf. But the problem is when we use it clinically, they get diluted no matter what you do. And so when you dilute those solutions, they don't work well. And that's what we found in, in the study. And I think that's why we felt like we were seeing bacterial regrowth because they're just not, they, you know, they, they, there's different effects. You can't put you know, the same chlorhexidine that you prep a wound with in a wound that's been shown to be very caustic. Hypochlorous acid is, is very oxidative. So you can't have a high right. con concentration of hypochlorous acid. And so therefore they're susceptible to dilution, which renders them not very good in terms of killing. That's great to know. So maybe uh, Miriam, can we uh, get a little update on some of the poll results that we had? And uh, are there any uh, questions from the uh, attendees that you'd like to share? 
Absolutely. So just going back to the polls, in terms of the irrigation solutions that our attendees are using, most of them are actually using the betadine and antibiotic solution combination, followed by using betadine, followed by antibiotic, and least common is the hypochlorous acid. We did have a few uh, attendees who don't use anything or use saline only. So that's interesting to know about. And hopefully this will be a um, challenge our thinking a little bit. Of our attendees, you know, despite everything that went on with FDA a few years ago, the general consensus is that betadine is safe to use around implants and um, the reasons that we're using antibiotic irrigation for implant related cases spans for all the causes that we talked about, so to prevent infections, capsular contracture, and to try and decrease the risk of BIA ALCL. Um, and it seems like most of our attendees are looking at changing their practice based on the results of this paper. So that's interesting to know. A lot of them have had experience with textured implants before, but now going forward, I'm sure in light of everything that's going on with ALCL, they're using it very rarely and more case by case basis if needed. So that's the results of our polls. So very informative to know. Now, in terms of questions that have been coming up, a very interesting theme is around, you know, the hot new sexy thing, which is hypochlorous acid in phase one. So I think that it would be really great if our author and discussant could comment on that, particularly maybe Dr. Adams, if you can just reiterate how, um, what your conclusions were in the study with regards to betadine as it compares to hypochlorous acid. There's been a lot of buzz around that in the recent year. So um, definitely our attendees want to know a bit more about that and whether there's any difference between the different types of hypochlorous acid there is. You know, phase one is very well known. It's a popular one, but there are, but it is more costly than some of the other alternatives such as um, Pearson Plus and Bosch and what your opinion is on those products. Yeah, well, I, 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 as I alluded to, the the problem with um, hypochlorous acid, phase one, all of those different category is it's very dilute hypochlorous acid, and that's that's because of what I mentioned earlier. And therefore, that just scientifically, they don't test well compared to the beta nine containing irrigation. So the beta nine containing irrigations can be diluted many fold um, and still have activity. Um, the other thing that's of interest is, is in, this is not in this paper, but in another paper uh, that's looked at hypochlorous acid solutions, um, they actually get inactivated with a protein soil test, um, which is kind of a standardized test that, that uh, the FDA or TGA um, has uh, all antiseptics go through. So there, there's some data out there that would indicate that um, it's, it's probably not, wouldn't be the, the choice to use, uh, especially given the fact that it's, what, 10, 20 times more expensive um, than, than Betadon. Oh, excellent, thank you. And then um, what's your opinion? You know, we did have at one of the previous ASJ um, journal clubs, we were discussing the efficacy of hypochlorous acid as being, you know, um, viricidal and helping with um, eradicate coronavirus. So there was some thought about using that it just in light of the current environment, not that, you know, we obviously don't have any um, uh, literature out there that shows whether viral infections such as that have a role in implant related issues, but I think it's something that is on um, patient, on people's minds. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we haven't certainly tested any, uh, we haven't tested coronavirus against any of these things, but, um, you know, I can tell you that I would, I would predict that you're going to see the same thing again. It's, it's, a, it's a function of concentration and stability um, for dilution, uh, but, you know, betadine, povidone iodine is, it's bactericidal, it's fung fungicidal, it's uh, viricidal. There is, I am aware of a study on betadine. We have nothing to do with it, but um, it was for um, people gargling with it um, prior to ENT procedures. And they found that, that it was able to um, kill viruses in the, the oropharynx. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, again, 
I just go back to the basic science, you know, if the, if, if there's, if, if something, um, you know, doesn't test well in the lab, then it's probably not going to perform well clinically. Um, and again, you know, one of the points we made in, in this paper is that there's 25 to 30 years now of, of really good data from multiple people, multiple places globally around the world using betadine uh, containing irrigations. And it's, it's really, it's hard, it's, it'll be hard to probably ever reproduce that with anything else, just given the success and efficacy of, of betadine containing irrigations. And we just had another yes, here that says, uh, what do you recommend if a patient's allergic to iodine? And also the offshoot of the uh, patient who mentions the shellfish allergy. How does that tie into this? Yeah, so those are, I I'm going to add that to the urban legend list. That, you know, the shellfish allergy, I've never seen um, anybody that has a so-called shellfish allergy have any issue with, with, with betadine. Um, uh, and again, I've, so in, in all the people that claim to be allergic, it's always, a, I have a shellfish allergy and then, well, we can't use betadine. Um, just, we've never seen that in a patient in 20 years. Um, so we use it in people with shellfish allergies. Um, so I've never seen anybody with any kind of allergic issue to betadine. Now, um, if you're using, say, betadine triple, so you have cefazolin and genomycin, obviously then, um, you can remove those and just just go with 50% betadine. Uh, if somebody has a, a cephalosporin allergy or they've got an aminoglycoside allergy. Hey, hey, Bill. One thing, one comment on that. Uh, when when someone writes down that they're allergic to iodine, I I always ask them specifically what they mean because almost 100% what they mean is iodine contrast. The same thing when they write shellfish yeah. allergy, it's iodine contrast. There is no cross-reactivity between iodine contrast and betadine. It's a completely different chemical. So if they're iodine contrast uh, allergic, you can use betadine. Uh, and I've done that too with a little skin test, just to prove it to them. Yeah. You know, when you say, no, yeah. when you hear the story, it doesn't really make sense. I just got a little prep here. If it reacts, we won't use it in surgery next week or yeah, in and, two and months. The, the, other thing you, the other thing you can ask if they've had previous surgery, uh, you ask them, have you had betadine prep or that brown prep? You say, oh, yeah, I had it, no problem. But you're, you know, you're iodine contrast allergic. It's no big deal. There is no cross-reactivity. Don't worry about it. That's great. Well, listen, you know, as soon as, uh, as, soon as I read this paper, uh, I knew that I wanted to discuss it in this uh, forum. I thought it was... A fantastic science looking at an important topic and you know looking at the poll results 67 percent of the respondents say that they would consider changing their implant pocket irrigation solution based on this based on the results so uh you know i'd like to thank you dr adams all of your uh, co-authors uh, for putting in the time and for you for coming on here tonight for dr Kana for coming on tonight for everybody uh, tuning you, in uh tonight i appreciate it all and uh, thank you, Phaedra, for <laughs> sharing with me, uh, in anticipation. Good of luck on Friday, Ryan. Girl or boy, we don't know. Congratulations. We'll find out. Why didn't we do a poll? We should have. I know. We talked about it. Is it we do a poll. Hang on a second. We still have 69 people on. Let's do a poll. So <laughs> we'll find out, is Ryan having a boy or a girl? And earlier we talked about letting the people decide. So I think everyone can get in on this. Um, cool. It's science. There you go. It's science. <laughs> Let's see if we're right. You'll have to let us know. I, I will. I will update you uh, at the at, on Instagram and on the next Journal Club. Ryan, I'm gonna have Jamil buy you some cleansing nails for me. <laughs> so it'll be for the for the new one. Full, it'll be full. It'll be full throttle though. <laughs> Can't wait. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, girls, this one's out 50. <laughs> girls in the lead with 48%. Nope, boy, 53%. Ryan, you're going to have to bring these stats back to your wife and, and <laughs> circle back and let us know how we did here. Oh, I know. There's a coin flip. Ooh, Last 51, 49. Um, wow. <laughs> that. Well, is, that, is, that, is that the distribution of males and females on this call? Yeah. No. <laughs> you and I both know, Bill, that's not true. <laughs> there we go. It's a boy. Well, not enough girls here yet. 
It's a boy. <laughs> it's official. Oh, there you go. With that poll, we're starting to lose some of our followers. So I think that's the, uh, <laughs> the real end of tonight's Journal Club. So Dr. Adams, thank you so much. Dr. Khanna, thank you so much. Everybody thank who you came, guys. took some time, thank, thank you, you so much. That's great. Appreciate Tune it. Tune in next month for the YAPS Journal Club. Tune in two months for the NGE Journal Club. We'll all see you then.